Hello, I'm Sarah Hewitt and I'm the professional family key worker and I work for the transition team here in Highland. I'm a learning disabilities nurse and part of my role is as a sleep practitioner for Sleep Scotland. So today's session is a, a short session really on sleep support and how to get the best out of our sleep and how to provide good sleep hygiene for our young people who have a neurodiverse condition my research tells us that four out of five young people and children who have a neurodevelopmental condition also have some form of sleep difficulty. Firstly, what is sleep? Sleep is a natural behaviour. We all have to sleep for some time out of every 24 hours. It's a reversible state of reduced awareness. So we can be woken from sleep, we can be roused fairly easily. If there's a dangerous situation happening, then generally we're woken from our sleep. Okay, it's a dynamic process. So there's a lot going on when we're sleeping. Our bodies don't just shut down. There's lots of processes still going on while we're asleep. Okay. I'm sure you're all very aware of how you feel when you've not had enough sleep. So a lack of sleep affects not just our physical well-being, but our emotional and our mental health as well. We all know that to stay healthy, we need to have a healthy diet. We need to get enough exercise, but we also need to get the right amount and the right quality of sleep. So we need good diet, good amount of physical exercise, and a good amount of quality sleep to stay healthy. So while we're asleep, there's a number of processes going on. One of those is that while we're sleeping, growth hormone is released into the body. So our muscle mass builds up, our bone density increases, and for children, this is when they grow. So it's really important. Also what happens when we're sleeping is it's our body's chance to repair itself. So any bumps, bruises, scrapes or knocks you've had during the day, this is when your body will start repairing itself. Our immune system's also strengthened during the night as well while we're sleeping. Your hormones are released as well that help to control your appetite. Our body and brain development is maximised during sleep as well. And it's also a part of our systems where our memory is consolidated. So all those experience we've, experiences we've had during the day, all those things we've learnt, new words, vocabulary, all those experiences that are currently in short-term memory during the day move into long-term memory at night. So it's an important process for learning and continued development. I'm sure we all know how we feel when we don't get enough sleep. Okay, so we're more likely when we don't get enough sleep to feel absolutely worn out. We struggle to stay alert and awake especially when it's quiet, especially if you've managed to find yourself in a warm, cosy room. It's really, really difficult to concentrate, to focus and to stay on task with things. You're more clumsy and accident prone. Your concentration, your focus isn't good, remember. You're more likely to, to have a much shorter temper. Okay, so you're much more likely to be grumpy. You're more likely to be impulsive, to experience bad behavior. It's much harder as well to control our emotions. So our emotional regulation is severely affected by the amount of sleep we've had or the lack of sleep we've had. Also, much more likely, if we don't have good quality sleep, 
to have low mood. And low mood leads, leads to depression and can also lead to anxiety. The brain stores different types of memory in different parts. Okay, so our positive or our neutral memories are stored in the hippocampus. Our negative memories tend to be stored or are stored in the amygdala. The hippocampus is more directly affected by our lack of sleep than the amygdala is. Okay, so people who suffer from a sleep deprivation are much more likely to focus on the negative experiences in their life than they are the positive ones. Because it's those negative experiences that are stored in our long-term memory. Because the lack of sleep affects that process whereby short-term memory is consolidated. So how much sleep should we be getting? A newborn baby, they need around about, round about 18 hours of sleep. A school of nursery age, about 11 and a half, 12 hours. Primary school age child, around about nine to 11 hours of sleep. A teenager, whilst they might like to think they need 24 hours of sleep, they actually only need around about nine to 11 and a half hours. And for an adult, around about seven and seven to eight hours. Now, that will vary between us all. We don't all need the same amount of sleep. Some people manage very well on six hours. Some of us need 10 hours. And some of us may only need eight hours. So it will vary. So you've got a, a deal of variance there by about one to one and a half hours for each of the age groups. Okay, so we'll have a, a little look at infant sleep first. So infants sleep a lot, okay? So their sleep-wake cycle is very much determined by the need to feed, the need to be changed, and the need to be nurtured, okay? So their sleep cycle looks very different to an older child or a full grown adult. The children up to the age of about one to one and a half, we would never contemplate on looking at a sleep management program for children, any younger than 18 months really, because they need amount of sleep and their sleep hasn't developed. Teenagers. And I'm quite often asked about teenagers and teenage sleep. Teenagers, from the age of 12 to 18, they're in a huge state of transition, both physiologically, emotionally, behaviourally, and there's lots of social change going on from them. Peer pressure, the dynamics of social relationships, um, that all has a massive impact on them. Now, physiologically, there's lots of changes and teenagers sleep shifts by about two hours. So, whereas your 12 year old may have wanted to go to bed around about nine o'clock, that will shift to about 11, 12 o'clock at night. And that is perfectly perfectly normal. It's a normal part of development for, for the teenage brain. They want to go to bed later. They want to get up much later in the day as well. Let's have a look at what our sleep looks like. This is a hypnogram. Okay, and a hypnogram is created by gathering lots of physiological information but essentially what it shows us is the different types of sleep that we experience. Okay, so this hypnogram is for a young person going through a full nine to 11 hours of sleep. It's really important to know 
that our bodies and brains are doing very specific things at different times during our sleep cycle. Each cycle of sleep, which you will see the, the lows and the highs, so each low and each high is a cycle of sleep. Each cycle lasts around 90 to 120 minutes and is comprised of both non-REM sleep and REM sleep. So REM is rapid eye movement. I'm sure you've all heard of that. So during non-REM sleep, which you'll see in blue, even though at times during this part of our sleep we are in our deepest sleep, our bodies are still working really hard and releasing hormones and this is where they're renewing and they're repairing tissues. During REM sleep, which you'll see in red, this happens at specific points during our sleep cycle. And this is often when we dream. So during REM sleep, we believe that the majority of our memory consolidation is done. We have the biggest blocks of our REM sleep towards the end of our full sleep cycle. So at the end of our nine to 11 hours say, of sleep. So at various points during the sleep cycle, we might wake up. We actually come, these highest points are points where we actually might wake up for a very brief period of time. You don't always remember that. On the whole, generally, you won't remember that. Sometimes what you'll remember is you might sometimes have that feeling of falling out of bed or turning over, and that's what that is. It's that period in your sleep where you've just briefly, briefly woken up. But it's really important during all the stages of our sleep, every night, to ensure, which ensures that our body and our brain has the right amount of time to carry out all the functions that are essential to remain unhealthy, okay? Now, this hypnogram is an example of a, of a nine-year-old sleep. So a nine-year-old generally should sleep for around 10 hours at night. So to be able to do that, generally they go to sleep around about 9 p.m., possibly wake up between 7 and 8 a.m. If that child doesn't go to sleep until 11, 12 o'clock at night, they're missing out a huge block of their sleep. So they're missing out on a huge part of the process where memory consolidation takes place. And that has a massive impact if that is a chronic situation that happens. So it has a massive impact on their learning and on their development. Our circadian rhythm or our body clock is controlled by a group of cells which are located in the hypothalamus part of the brain. In order to keep our body clock regulated, so to keep it running smoothly, our bodies react to external stimuli. These external stimuli are really, really important at resetting the body clock every day. So these stimuli, the most important one is light, having regular meal times, our social interactions, when those occur, when those happen, what time of day those happen, external temperature, if it's warm, if it's cold, if it's cold, generally don't tend to feel sleepy, and sound. We're designed to sleep through the darkest period in 24 hours. Okay, so we're designed to sleep at night time. It's an, an, an evolutionary hung up that we have. Okay, and we're designed to be active and alert during the day. Our bodies recognize those fluctuations and those changes in light and temperature. 
And those are the signals that start to make us feel sleepy. There are two main hormones that are responsible for being awake and for being asleep. Okay. And they're very, very important. Melatonin. I'm sure you've all heard of melatonin. Okay, this is a hormone that starts to make you feel sleepy. It's not a hormone that will keep you asleep during the night. It just helps you to get over into sleep. Okay, so that hormone is produced by the external stimuli of dark. So dark helps produce melatonin. Light light produces the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is the ho hormone that's responsible for keeping us awake and alert throughout the day. I'm sure you've all heard of the, the stress hormone and that's what cortisol is. It's that stress hormone. Okay. And if we're particularly physically or mentally stressed, then our bodies produce more co cortisol. And cortisol prevents us from being sleepy. So if we're sleep deprived, then we have much more cortisol in our bodies than we typically should have. So our body clock is responsible for managing the release of certain hormones, our kidney function, our muscle repair, our sleep and our body temperature regulating our body temperature. At various times of the day and the night, we're naturally programmed to do different things. Between 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. and midnight, this is when our temperature falls, our adrenaline levels drop, our cortisol levels should drop, and our melatonin will rise. Okay, the effect of this is that we feel le less alert and we begin to feel sleepy and prepare for sleep. Melatonin isn't released continuously through the night. It's released in a flood of melatonin, usually just about the time that we're preparing for bed, that we're getting ready for bed and we begin to feel sleepy. Around 8 a.m. our blood pressure rises, our blood platelets are actually at their stickiest. Okay, so that's when we have the greatest load on our heart and we're at the greatest risk at that time of day of having a heart attack. Between 12 noon and 2 p.m. we have a fall on our adrenaline and that's when we feel like going and having those 40 winks, usually about lunchtime or just after lunch. That's usually when we feel like going and having a wee nap. Between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m., our temperature is at its highest. The effects of mental fatigue really start to, to show at that time. Our ability to complete more complex tasks de decreases, but our physical performance is generally at its best. And that's generally a brilliant time to go out and have a run or go and run a race. Let's look at the relationship between cortisol and melatonin and what can impact that. Our biggest impact on the production of melatonin is light. Okay, and this is the light from screens, mainly. In today's, today's world, it's how often do we spend, or how much time do we spend looking at our phones looking at our iPads, being on the computer or being on a games console. Okay, so these have a dramatic impact and can really affect our production of melatonin. Okay, cortisol won't decrease if we're constantly on a screen because we're getting that white light and it's white light stops that production of melatonin. 
So you're always here about the importance of reducing the amount of time on screens, particularly around bedtime. We need to have a little think about the jet lag effect, okay? And I'm not just talking about being on a transatlantic flight and suffering from not being able to get back into a sleep routine, okay? What happens frequently in everybody's lives from Monday to Friday, if you're at school, if you're going to work, you're generally in a pretty good routine. But say you, you're at school Monday to Friday, you have every weekend off. Friday night you think, I can stay up later. And I can have a lie-in on Saturday morning. And we do that again on Saturday night. And when it comes to Sunday night, it's much more difficult to shift back into our routine to shift back and going to bed at nine o'clock at night. And it's harder to get off to sleep. So typically on a Monday, it's much harder to get up again in the morning. It's harder to concentrate. It's harder to stay on task. We're usually pretty groggy and nobody likes a Monday. And that's why, because we're suffering from that jet lag effect. So it's really, really important even at weekends, to try and stay into some kind of normal routine. So how do we go about getting good sleep? Okay, do you remember we talked about our brains and our body clock needing those external factors, those external messages and cues to keep our body clock in sync and keep it regulated? Okay, so getting out in, outside into natural light, to natural sunlight, if we've got any here in Scotland, for at least 30 minutes a day, if possible. Avoiding sugar and caffeine. Sugar and caffeine in themselves can stop us from feeling sleepy, okay? They can disrupt that production of melatonin. It's important to look at the types of drinks that we are drinking as well and remembering that lots of sugary type drinks, fizzy drinks, will also contain caffeine. A big one just now for the teenagers, of course, is the energy drinks. Avoid them if possible. Okay. Avoid napping. Avoid having those naps during the day. I know that it's, it's not always possible, particularly if we're not feeling very well. Having a nap during the day can affect our ab ability to feel sleepy later on. Finding ways of dealing with our stress and our anxiety. It's really important to not focus on our stress or our anxiety around bedtime because that will increase our cortisol levels. Our cortisol levels won't decrease if we're focusing on our stress and our anxiety round about bedtime. So it's much better if we need to, to focus on that a little earlier during the day. And of course, trying to avoid having that long lie in at the weekend. And that's not always possible, especially if you've got a social event on. So during the evening, if possible, getting homework out of the way for children as early as possible and not leaving it till after tea time. Now, that's, that's not always an easy task to do because I know that most children, the last thing they want to do when they come home is get their homework out and sit and focus on their homework but it will help them to wind down and to calm the brain down if that is out of the way as early as possible. Okay. Having a good meal and having regular meal times, not too late, because then that again can impact on our quality of sleep. Avoiding any stimulating activities in the evening. So avoiding 
going out playing. You know, don't plan for a trip to the trampoline park if you need a, a good sleep. So be careful about what your child is watching on television. Be careful about what they're playing if it's a computer game that they're on. Always being aware of what they're doing. It's at this point in the evening, in that last hour before bedtime, that we want to switch off any screens. So the computer, the TV, the iPad, the tablet, get off Facebook, you know, particularly for teenagers. Social media is a huge thing and for a lot of them it's very, very difficult to come away from that. But we have to try and encourage them the best that we can. Having a bath is a fantastic way to relax. Okay, it helps the body, it rises your, raises your body temperature and then your body temperature quickly cools as you come out of the bath, which can help you to feel sleepy. Okay, it's a relaxing activity. Don't have a shower around bedtime because the water falling on your body is actually stimulating and helps to maintain all those hormones that keep you awake during the day. Read a book, a proper book, paper pages, not something off your iPad or off a tablet because even though you may have turned the screen brightness down as far as you can, your brain is still receiving that white light, which it won't get from reading a book. But be aware, especially for younger children, what type of story that they're reading. Because if it's a Captain Marvel adventure or it's Spider-Man, it could be something really exciting, you're not going to have the desired effect. Stick as closely, especially at the weekends, to the same bedtime every night. And we're also thinking about the same waking up time in the morning, which helps establish and reinforce our circadian rhythms. Okay, even at weekends, always try and keep to those regular bedtimes and getting up times in the morning. Relaxation at bedtime. Thinking about what helps you to lower your arousal levels, to help you relax, your muscles relax, your mind relax. Activities such as listening to a meditation app quietly in your bedroom or doing some very gentle relaxation deep breathing exercises. The environments in which we sleep in have a massive impact on our sleep as well. So thinking about a typical teenager's bedroom. They are usually full of gadgets. We have TV screens, consoles, lights, chairs. It's not very often I, I come across a teenager who's tidy. So there's usually lots of mess. There could be musical instruments. There could be a whole manner of things going on. Thinking about as well, the decoration in a bedroom. Lots of parents like to use, or are often bought, particularly for young children, light shows, mobiles. But all these types of, of toys can be very, very stimulating and can actually counter, be counterproductive with sleep. So children find it much harder to get to sleep. So an ideal environment is that a bedroom is just for sleeping. It's not a social area. More difficult to manage with our teenagers because teenagers' bedrooms do tend to be more of a social area. They, te they tend to become quite reclusive to their bedrooms in their teenage years. So it's important to encourage them out of their bedrooms to come and eat family meals and to spend time out of their rooms, particularly with their friends as well. It's important for bedrooms to be at the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold. It's really important to have lighting at the correct level. Okay, so we want it dark. We don't want any light. 
If you have a child that won't go to sleep unless there's a light on, if they need a light, a night light, then I would recommend a red light because that doesn't produce as much white light as lots of the, the grow bag clocks and the grow bag eggs that you, that you can buy. I'd also look at if the door needs to be open of leaving a very low light on in a hall or on a landing. Bedrooms as well should be as clear as possible of distractions. For young children, if you have no other place in the house to store toys other than their bedroom, then at the same time your child goes to bed, put the toys to bed. Clear them away so they're not a distraction. So there's no incentive there for your little one to climb out of bed and go and play with toys when they actually should be sleeping soundly or going off to sleep soundly. All electronic equipment should either be out or removed from the bedroom, ideally not in there at all, or turned off so that they can't be turned back on again if that's a possibility. And one of the most important environmental aspects is quiet, having a quiet environment to sleep in. Nocturnal pets are often the biggest disturber of sleep and it's something that we don't always think about. Those children who have hamsters or guinea pigs or gerbils or any other name of nocturnal animal at night time will come out and make a noise at night and that'll disturb your youngster's sleep. Fish tanks as well are also something to think about if you've got a fish tank in a bedroom particularly if it's a fish tank that has lights on inside it. Having a comfortable, safe, warm place to sleep. Having a bed, having a good mattress, having good bedding. Really important to ensure that we, that we get a really good quality sleep. Okay, so what does a good bedtime routine look like? Here's a good example of what a good bedtime routine looks like. So around 5.30, 6 o'clock in, in the evening, having your evening meal. A bit of playtime in between then. But if we're looking to go to bed around 8 o'clock, around about 7 o'clock, we want to try and quieten things down a, a bit. So doing a nice quiet activity like a jigsaw, doing some drawing, playing with a train set, it's also a good time to think about having a, a snack around that time, but avoiding those high calorie, um, sugared, high sugar snacks or drinks. You know, having a, a, a drink of milk, having a, a, a slice of toast or a light sandwich, something light is often good at that time. Having a relaxing bath around about 7.20 avoiding excessive playtime in the bath as well if you can. Your aim is to keep things as quiet and as calm as you possibly can. Pajamas, teeth cleaned and into bed after a bath. If you can avoid going back downstairs if you live in a, in a house or back into the main living room after the child, your child has got ready for bed, that's fantastic because we're sending, giving the child the right signals that it's time for sleep, it's not time for play or social time again. Okay, so into bed, a nice bedtime story around about 7.45. But don't extend your bedtime stories. Children always want five minutes more and five minutes more. Keep to a, a set time. Cuddles from mum, dad, and then leave your child to settle. That would be an exemplary bedtime routine. Again, remembering about 
the impact that environment has on our sleep and creating a bedroom that is just a room for sleeping in, making sure it's nice and dark. One of the things I do come across quite often when I'm supporting families, particularly for teenagers, is teenagers who like to game, but will shut themselves into their bedroom during the daytime and have the curtains closed. Okay, so those teenagers inevitably have difficulty settling down to sleep at night because their brains aren't getting those external stimuli that signal that they want to get ready for sleep. So it's important for those gamers amongst us that they're not sitting in dark rooms when they're gaming, that they do have natural daylight on them. So remembering to think about the lighting in rooms as well. Putting in a night light if needed, but making sure that's a red light. Avoid any blue lights, white lights. Making sure the bedrooms are as clear from distractions as possible. So toys going to bed, being covered over by a blanket, being put in a cupboard, being put in a box with the lid on, making sure everything else is out of sight. Making sure all the electrical equipment is taken either out of the room or is turned off so it can't be turned back on again. Making sure the child has a quiet environment to sleep in. Decoration in bedrooms as well can have an impact on children's sleep. Particularly if you have a bedroom that's really busy with lots of posters or pictures on the walls. I would I recommend that those are removed if your young person has a difficulty with going off to sleep or sleeping or staying asleep at night. One of the biggest impacts on our sleep, certainly from my perspective as a sleep practitioner, is anxiety. Okay, and just some strategies that may help with reducing anxiety at going to bedtime are creating that relaxing environment, allowing that young person to relax and become comfortable. Okay, so including activities like drawing or colouring in, having a banana or a, a warm drink of milk, which will help the body relax because bananas contain tryptophan, which helps promote sleepiness as well. Relaxation techniques, breathing exercises, listening to a meditation app. But if you're using technology to listen to meditation apps or listen to story tapes, remembering that those gadgets shouldn't have any light emitting from them. <laughs> and as corny as it sounds, Counting sheep helps as well. Let's look at a child who has difficulty with settling at night time. And a really good strategy to use is what we call the disappearing chair strategy. You just see it's a graduated withdrawal from the child. And it, 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 it will decrease a child's anxiety around going to bed and learning to settle themselves in bed. Okay, so what we do is child is in bed, sit beside them on a chair, not on the bed. And you might need initially to still have some physical contact with them. So a hand on the bed, on their hand or on an arm, not full leaning over into bed and cuddling your child. Okay, we want them to learn to settle without having full physical contact from a parent. Sit by the bed and be as boring as you possibly can, okay? Not engaging of conver in conversation, not having one more kiss and a cuddle, not having five minutes more of story. If you are as boring as you possibly can be, your child will eventually settle down. And at some point, for lots of children, 
within that sleep wake cycle, they might waken up in the middle of the night as well. And you would use the same strategy again to settle them back down. Okay, so we're sitting beside them in a chair. And gradually, on night two, you would move that chair slightly further away. Night three, further away again. Night four, further away again. Until gradually, you've managed to make your way out of the bedroom. Now, this may take a week. It may take two weeks. It might take six weeks. You have to be able to judge the pace that's correct for your child. The key is being consistent. The key is being exceptionally boring. But perseverance is the biggest key to making this strategy work. And it does work. If your child wakes up in the middle of the night, then you'll need to go through this routine again to resettle them. Again, limiting interaction and engagement with them, not speaking to them, not talking, not giving instruction, if you can help it. Use very short, simple sentences. Sleep time, into bed, and not getting drawn into any long convoluted conversations or negotiations with them. And it will eventually work. But again, the keys are consistency, perseverance, and it will work. Okay. So, the crucial elements of children's sleep is having clear messages from you as parents and carers. Clear messages about going to bed, what time is it is for bed, and not being non-negotiable on that. Being consistent. Staying with the same routine every night and every morning. Waking your child at the same time every morning will help reinforce their circadian rhythm. Timing. Thinking about how much sleep your child requires, the timing of meals, the timing of homework sessions, and making sure that that last hour, that last block of time before they go to bed is as relaxing as, and as non-stimulating as it possibly can be. Diet, making sure that they're eating at regular times, at regular meal times. Not always easy, particularly with the busy lifestyles that we all have. Remember to relax. If you're relaxed as the parent, as the carer, then your child will also begin to relax about it around bedtime. If you're anxious and if you're worried or if you're hurried about it, your child will pick up on those signals, okay? If you're relaxed about the whole process, then you've got a much better chance of achieving the goal of having a full night's sleep. Always remember that sleep is a behaviour. So we have to teach good sleep practice and good sleep behaviour. And if a child has good sleep, then your young person will have much better outcomes in terms of learning, achieving, and being able to regulate themselves in their waking hours. So what help and support is there available in Highland for children who have a sleep difficulty? Okay. Sleep Scotland, there is a wealth of information available to you on the Sleep Scotland website. There is also a sleep counselling phone line that you can phone for advice at any time. Okay. We also offer face-to-face -face sleep counselling. And in Highland, Sleep Scotland practitioners are scarce, I'm afraid. This is only a very small proportion of what I do in my day-to-day -day work in life, okay? If your child is having a sleep difficulty, it's important to let your named person know because of the impact that that can have on your child's learning and your child's development at school. 
your name person can then get in contact with a sleep counsellor. Your GP is also a point of contact for a sleep difficulty, as are your community paediatricians. They will also help support you with sleep. Learning disability nurses, they're also a point of contact if your child or your young person is having a sleep difficulty. You can self-refer. You can go via the Sleep Scotland website and find the contact details for your Sleep Scotland practitioner. Or your named person or your health visitor, your GP can also contact us directly.